we're so excited tonight to have Laurel K. Hamilton with us here. Um, she's talking about her new book, Sucker Punch, that just came out Tuesday. Here is my bl blanket spoiler alert. Uh, please keep spoilers out of the comments. If you have questions, uh, don't ask any spoilery questions. Here is my general tip. If you are not sure whether or not your question is a spoiler, it probably is because that's generally how it goes. Um, so maybe refrain from those. We wanna make sure that everybody has a chance to kind of get to experience the book uh, the same way. Um, may, may I add something that yes. I've noticed online, especially on Twitter, uh, if you'll ask some questions. You can ask about specific characters, but please do not ask about a character that it is not, uh, that it's a surprise that they're there in this book. Please don't ask about them being in this book. That is a spoiler. You can ask about the character, but not specifically because they appeared in this book. Awesome. Good. Uh, so uh, Laurel K. Hamilton is the number one New York Times bestselling author of the Anita Blake Vampire Hunter series and the uh, Mary Gentry series. With over 30 books published, she continues to create stories inspired by her lifelong love of monster movies, ghost stories, mythology, and folklore. She lives in St. Louis, running away Oh, sorry, the running away to the tropics is a possibility with her family. Two spoiled Japanese chins, a house panther, and a house lion. In her free time, Laurel trains in Filipino martial arts with a special specialization in blade work and enjoys reading, nature observation, and scuba diving. So tech issues aside, how are you doing tonight, Laurel? Uh, now that I can actually see you and my screen's not going black every few minutes, it's awesome. <laughs> I mean, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, thank you so much for doing this with us. Um, this is the 27th book in the Anita Blake series. That's that's crazy. When you got started, did you have any idea that you would still be doing this almost 30 books in? No, uh, especially because my very first series uh, was supposed to be a four book series. Night Seer was bought and published, but as many first novels do, it did not sell well enough. They didn't want the sequel. And so when I signed uh, the first Anita contract, it was for three books. And I remember very much thinking, at least there'll be three books in this series. And now here we are, number 27. No, I had no idea. And, and that first failure to have my series makes this all the sweeter. Yeah. Um, so you, you know, were one of kind of the early people doing urban fantasy when kind of really nobody was doing it. So over the course of this series, you've gotten to see the genre kind of in its start, you've gotten to see it explode, you got to see it kind of dwindle a little bit, and now it's slowly starting to make a comeback. Um, you know, Kim Harrison just brought us back to the Hollow series, Kelly Armstrong's been playing in the Otherworld um, series again. Um, we're starting to see vampires slowly make a comeback with Stephanie Meyer just releasing Midnight Sun. Um, another guy, Caleb Rarg, wrote a really great uh, gay YA vampire novel called Bell of Dark that just came out. Why do you think that we're starting to see all of this um, come back again? Um, I don't, I don't know. I don't know why the market goes up or down. I mean, if, if anybody, if I could really predict that, um, I would know ahead of time, but <laughs> I, I'm not that kind of prescient. Yeah. Uh, I think it is interesting though, because when I started out, I literally had guilty pleasures. People rejected it. And literally, I still remember that one of the rejection letters was vampires are dead is a genre. Don't you know that? Yeah. The market can't bear one more vampire novel. And because somebody else brought a vampire novel out that, that, that week, they used that as a way to reject mine. They mentioned the other book and I, in the rejection letter. And it was like, is like, it's vampires, they don't stay dead. Don't you understand that? Uh, apparently not. So, you know, the monsters never leave us. They never do. And um, paranormal didn't exist. Urban fantasy didn't exist when I was trying to sell the, the series. Um, you know, it came out in 93, but I had actually been trying to sell for several years and I wrote it at the end of the, night, the late 80s. So nobody knew what to do with it. And I have to say one of my favorite moments uh, years later was sitting on a panel at Dragon Con with like six to eight other writers in this genre and going, and I remember everyone telling me this wouldn't work. And so, you know, here we all are now. I mean, you mentioned some, and uh, of course, Charlene Harris, uh, you know, Larry Correa, uh, you mentioned Jim Butcher, Kim Harrison, and um, Faith Hunter, uh, 
Christine. And I mean, I, I know I'm not remembering everybody. I know that, and I'm sorry. But they're so, it's just wonderful to know that, that you know, everyone does want to play in the same way I do. Yeah, it's been great. As the kind of pandemic started kind of back in March, I was having a really hard time just kind of focuses, focusing and reading. And we got the event set up with Kim Harrison and I realized that I had missed a couple books in the series. So I just kind of got to like binge them. And it was so great to kind of just get to dive back into the genre. I remember why I love it. So I'm, I'm really glad to see that we're starting to see some bubblings of stuff coming back up and, and people playing with it again. Um, and then, of course, people like you and, and Patty Briggs and Alona Andrews have kind of been doing it the whole time. Whereas, you know, like Charlene's done, she did the Midnight Texas books, and now she's kind of doing Weird West and playing with some other stuff. So it's nice to see that, um, you know, like I said, you were kind of consistent through all of that. Uh, so tonight we're here to talk about Sucker Punch. Uh, do you want to give us a quick elevator pitch for what this one is? I suck at the elevator pitch. Uh, <laughs> I will just warn you ahead of time. I, I know, really, honestly, I'm not exaggerating on being humble. I, I really am bad at this. We can step on a couple extra floors. It's okay. <laughs> uh, if I was better at this, there'd probably be a movie by now. But um, Sucker Punch is Anita getting, uh, she has been called in by a junior marshal that she's sort of a mentor for, somebody that we've seen in the books before. And he has had, uh, he has a warrant of execution coming in for somebody, and he's not sure that he's got the right guy. He's not sure he's about to kill the right person, and he doesn't want to kill the wrong person because you can't apologize. So he's asking him to move an emergency trip in and to give him her expertise to make sure that the right person dies for this murder and that the system is not being manipulated because what he's really afraid of, if it is, then they're trying to use the U.S. Marshal Service with the warrants of execution basically as a murder weapon. And so he wants her help to make sure the real person gets punished. And did he do it? And who done it? And how did they do it if he didn't do it? So it's, it is a very, it is very much her with a badge doing her job as a U.S. Marshal, except that instead of heading down the monster to kill, she is trying to solve the crime and trying to save a life for once. One of the things that I love about the series and kind of the genre as a whole is the way that it takes kind of really great classic mystery elements and it blends them with these paranormal elements. Were you a big mystery reader before you started working on these? Um, I wasn't a big mystery reader. I only found mystery after college. And, but finding, uh, finding the hardball detective fiction just after college at the same time that I was trying to figure out a series. I think if I had read it years ago, that it wouldn't have been as fresh in my mind as a voice. And so actually the fact that I, I became a big mystery reader after I had started reading them. So I'm, I'm a serious mystery reader now, but it came, I came to it late. Uh, so who are some of your favorite mystery authors? Uh, Robert B. Parker Spencer series. Uh, I, I, I love it. Uh, that was, you can still see the echo of his dialogue and Anita's dialogue. And through him, of course, uh, Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler, like, like, like a lineage down there, you can still hear the echo of language. Yeah. Um, and I, I read, um, I read a lot more cozy mysteries actually than I read hard boiled. Um, because I want to, I don't want to read something that's similar to what I do yeah. when I'm, when I'm on my, um, uh, uh, doing a break. Though, actually, I started getting into a real nonfiction. I don't know if it's, if it's lockdown or what, but I'm reading, I'm reading less fiction than, than normal. I'm reading more nonfiction, which is weird for me. I, I'm really, I only do that for research, and now suddenly I'm, I'm reading it, 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 it for pleasure. Yeah. I just don't think of nonfiction that way, but apparently so. We'll have to, I'm the, the resident cozy reader at the store, so we'll have to chat later and, and compare some notes on some cozy mysteries. Um, and I know you guys have a lot of questions in the comments, so I'm going to start getting to some of those. So Carrie asks, um, what is your favorite book that you've written so far? I don't have a favorite book. It's like, what's your favorite child? Um, if you ask me what's my favorite book, it's usually the one that just got finished because it's just done. And I'm always, I'm always on a high when I finish a book. Uh, so there's no way... There's no way for me to answer that. Um, so Shannon asks, where did the decision to do multiple species of animals as locals come from? 
Um, I have a, I'm a biologist. I, I, I used to say I have a degree in biology until um, several biologists at, I was on a science panel and they corrected, they asked, well, did you get your degree? Was it a award? And I said, yes, I have my degree. And they said, well, then you're a biologist. I said, but I've never done this for a living. And they said, well, a lot of people don't earn their living from their biology degree. That's true. <laughs> That's very true. Unless you have a master's or a doctorate, you usually don't. Uh, so I'm a non-practicing biologist is what I call it. And uh, so for me, doing multiple animals just makes sense. And the folklore and mythology research to go along with more in-depth research on the actual animals, the actual real world animals, uh, help me realize that pretty much if there is an animal in the area that can eat you or kill you, that's going to be a shapeshifter in that locality. Uh, it's like we, we turn whatever we were afraid of into something uh, fo in mytholo mythological so that would, I don't know, I don't know, I get, maybe it made that easier to cope with the fact that you could go off in the, go off in the forest and get eaten by a bear. I don't know. Uh, so Hannah asks, uh, when writing characters who deal with personal issues, specifically mental health stuff, do you research um, and do you have specific ailments in mind or do the characters tend to write themselves? The characters tend to choose themselves. Um, I don't sit down and go, I'm going to create somebody with X, Y, or Z. The characters come and kind of have their own list. They, they, they help create themselves in many ways, and that is one of them. Um, uh, I... So I guess that answers the question, or was there, yeah. was there a second part to yeah. that question? Uh, so, and what kind of research do you do? Ah, thank you. Um, I actually, I've been in therapy off and on since my 20s. So, uh, and I honestly wouldn't have made it out of my 20s without therapy. It, it was just harsh. And so good therapy, I'm a huge, huge proponent of, yay, good therapy. Having said that, um, I, I, I have enough background in it and, uh, I don't talk to people about their mental health, but I do run into people when I'm researching for other things mm -hmm. that happen to have certain issues. Um, I am, uh, I was lucky enough to be able to talk to somebody who really was card care and sociopath and diagnosed and everything and, and really healthy though. First person in the room that would offer you a Kleenex if you were crying. First person in the room that would offer you, uh, you know, uh, a throat lozenge if you coughed. Yeah. You would never, ever have known this person was yeah. a sociopath, ever. And I was lucky enough that they sat down and talked to me at length about um, how it was. And they were lucky. They were diagnosed very young. And how they were diagnosed is that their mother's younger brother was also a sociopath. And she knew it. She saw the signs. And she took them aside early and says, okay, this is what you are. And I know you don't understand why we cry. And I know you don't understand this, this, and this. But you have to pretend you do. You have to fit in. And so very, very early on, they were socialized so that they, they did. And... But we talked at length, and, and one of the things that I came away with is that if you didn't know you were a sociopath, if you didn't know that other people do things because they feel empathy and everything, I think you might not figure it out. You would think everybody else was behaving that way because of the same reason you are. How would you ever know? And that led me to, I had already created uh, Olaf as a character by then, uh, but Nikki hadn't come on, on the scene yet. So um, I think that was, that may have been influenced why, why I tried again to have somebody on, on stage that I could deal with on a more regular basis before. Because I, I was fascinated with it. That was, that was I was very uh, lucky to get, the, get somebody who talked to me so openly about it and everything. Um, so uh, real quick, Rebecca asked in the comments, has everyone here read the book? No, Rebecca, there are lots of people saying they, they haven't read it yet. There is copies haven't come yet, as we were mentioning, um, kind of shipping delays. So that's why we've got the blanket. Be real careful of spoilers. So don't worry, Rebecca, not everybody's read it yet. Um, so kind of going off the, the research stuff that you were talking about, does it get easier now that you're this many books in because you have a lot more contacts to be able to reach out to people to ask for things? 
Um, in some ways, I mean, I mean, when I first started out and had sold nothing, nobody wanted to talk to me. And they, I had no way to prove I was really a writer. One of the interesting things to me early on when I wanted to talk to, especially police, is that they thought I was a reporter pretending to write a novel because some of them had been burned by people pretending that they were fiction writers and turned out to be reporters and then would use what they had heard to publish in an article and got them in trouble. So I, I, being a fiction writer was not a deficit to a lot of cops. The fact that I might have been a journalist was. And uh, so now I have my bona fides. I can sit there and go, look, books. Um, so they'll talk to me, though right now people will offer uh, but I have people that I've been talking to for years. And so, so yeah, it's easier because more people will talk to me and I probably can reach out, but I try to be very careful and not take advantage of people's expertise because their time is valuable. And, uh, if you are researching and using experts, uh, all you would be writers out there, please, before you talk to an expert, get a magazine about it, get a book about it do your research first. Like before I talked to anybody about guns, I got gun magazines. There's plenty of them. And I, I read some of the history of firearms before I found a real person to talk to, because if you just go in and tell somebody, tell me about guns, you've done no research, you're lazy and they know it. And why should they give you all their expertise? Um, I, I've seen several people have asked um, when COVID isn't happening, can you potentially come to one city? How much traveling do you do? Can you talk a little bit about kind of the book tour process under normal circumstances? <laughs> <laughs> if there is a normal circumstance for book travel, but, but more normal than this. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, I, I've done the really big tours. I mean, One Lives in Infinities is I did 26 cities in 28 days. Wow. My husband went with me, brave, brave man that he is. <laughs> And uh, weirdly, it was just after 9-11. It was October after 9-11. So uh, that was its own experience. But I've done, I've done the six-week tour, three, three to six-week tour, and done a lot of cities. And you do a different city every day. It's sort of like being rock stars, but less noisy. Um, and I have to say that I love seeing you all, but where is my TARDIS? Where is my teleportation? You know, where's my flu powder? Something because I hate to travel. I absolutely freaking hate to travel. And I'm, I'm phobic of flying. I've been in two planes that I've been in one plane that almost went down. I've been in another one that's caught on fire in the air. And so I'm not fond of flying. I will do it. And I do do it, but it is, it is, it is not my favorite thing. Uh, so, so I will be coming out to more cities once COVID is no more. But um, I won't travel in the winter because too many planes get canceled. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I get stranded somewhere from a blizzard. Um, and uh, I have trouble. I have trouble with uh, elevation. So you can get me, you can either get me in a few days early, which nobody will do, or you get me in and get me out really quick before my body goes, oh my God, what, what elevation are we at? So I have to sit there and go, okay, planning it, if it's taught, if, if, and it's interesting, it's interesting. If I was um, less fragile, less weird about everything, uh, then it would be easier to travel. But uh, yeah, allergic to everything, can't do elevations well, yeah. Um, so Sable asks, it's not an Anita question, that's totally fine, Sable. Do you plan on ever doing any Mary Gentry graphic novels like you did with the first few Anita books? No plans right now. Um, there was some talk when the Anita books uh, were being in graphic form, but then, then a lot of things happen at the same time. Um, I, Anita just had just come out with Marvel, just as Marvel and Disney merged or mm -hmm. became one. And um, uh, the book, they just finished the first three, the first three books. Yes, first three books. Uh, the next one up was Lunatic Cafe and the prime mystery goes around a snuff film. The mouse said no. The mouse, Disney, Disney's not going to do graphic novels that do that. That's just, that's just not going to be their gig. And um, so we just, 
it was bad timing. But for a very brief moment, for a very brief moment, Anita was sort of a sort of a Disney princess, which amuses me. Um, so when that didn't happen, then the idea of doing Mary didn't happen either. And um, also people were kind of wondering how they would do certain scenes graphically in a graphic format. And, you know, how many word balloons can you use kind of thing. Um, and a perfect segue, I also wanted to say from everybody at the store, uh, thank you so much for the, the generous uh, offer of all of the copies of The First Death to go with uh, copies of Sucker Punch. We, I, I know the readers appreciated it, and as, as a bookstore, we really appreciated that too. So thank you, thank you for that. You're very welcome. I, I'm sorry, during all this, all the COVID and everything, um, you know, uh, I just wanted to do something extra. I want to say, you know, I, I can't, I can't wave a magic wand and make this go away. If I would, if I could, I would, but I can give you something extra. And First Death is a prequel in graphic format Two guilty pleasures. It is the case where Edward burns the house down around them with the flight there. Because you guys have requested to see that. And I can do prequels in the graphic novels because I don't have to do the deep dive into how she's thinking. Because I don't think like, she doesn't think like that anymore. That's her before so much happened. Um, Kitty asks, kind of going back to talking about kind of um, how I need to think thought back then. How long did it take for you to write Guilty Pleasures? Um, I don't remember, I'll be honest, um, because I did seven drafts of it, okay. and I don't remember how much the first draft took, because that's really what most people want. They don't want to know how many it took you to do seven drafts, they want the first one. It's It's been too many years, I don't remember. Uh, I know that it wasn't as fast as I, as I got to be, because I didn't know how to do it. Um, I did uh, seven drafts and then I met an agent at a science fiction fantasy convention. She would be my first agent at that point. And uh, she said, and, and here's what she asked me, all you wanting to have agents, the only thing she asked me was, after she knew it was the genre, it was, it was science fiction and fantasy, she said, how many drafts have you done? And I said, seven. And she says, all right, send it to me. And, and then I went home, did an eighth draft and sent it to her. But she said later that if I had said that I had only done one draft, she would have told me not to send it. Um, so uh, can go on with that. Nikki asks, um, what did you do to get published in the very beginning? And what advice do you have for people who are just starting out and want to publish? Well, first of all, um, please don't self-publish unless that pays better than it sounds. Um, and please try, do what I did which is look on and see what markets pay the best. Make sure there are markets that actually buy what you're writing. Nothing says amateur like sending a mystery to a house that only does straight horror with no mystery in it. Yeah. Know who you're sending it to. Know the name of the editor. You can, it's easier now with the internet to find out who the new one is. You used to have to use uh, writer's, uh, writer's Digest and, and uh, the writer's marketplace, writer's market. And sometimes that was out of date, but people accepted that because it was published, not online. Um, so find out who to send it to and send it to them. Find out if they'll take unsolicited manuscripts. What do I mean by that? It means a manuscript they didn't request. Um, and uh, find out what form they like it in and try to meet their professional criteria. Uh, and, and start with the highest paying market that will have you. And then if they reject you, then go down and to less pay markets, but don't give your stuff away. It's your job. It's art, but it's your job. Um, you know, I support my family. I, that's what, this is what's paying my daughter through college. This is your job. Please treat it like that and respect yourself. Um, and also if you can't take projection, this is not your gig. I, I'm just going to say that. Um, at least we're not like actors who get rejected in person so often, but you are going to get rejected and that's okay. That's absolutely okay. Uh, Ray Bradbury had a wonderful article in either the writer or writer's digest years ago that I read as a teenager and it really helped me. And that the advice in that was to pick the smallest room in your house and then wallpaper it with rejection slips. And when you wallpapered it completely, you will have written all the crap out and you will to be to the gold of what you and your voice has to say. 
So you're supposed to get rejected. That that's just true. Any any story you hear on the in out in the media of the person who never got rejected is just a story or it's a one off. It's it's lightning strike. Most of us get rejected a lot. Guilty Pleasures, the first Anita book, got rejected over 200 times. Over 200 times. Now, remember, there were more publishers then. Everybody hadn't merged and glommed with each other. But literally, over 200 times, think about what would have happened if I'd given up after three or five. You wouldn't be having the 27th book. You wouldn't have Sucker Punch. Um, and I would be doing something else besides writing. So believe in yourself, believe in what you do, and, and keep sending it out. And, and most of us have trunk books, which means that the first novel you write is, is very likely not going to be the first one you sell, because you have to learn how to write a book, and you don't know how to do that out of the gate. I'm very, very lucky. My first novel, Night Seer, first one I ever written, sold. But notice the earlier story. The second one didn't sell because I didn't really know how to write a novel. I lucked out the first time. It was, it was pure chance that I actually wrote a novel that was publishable. There were two novels in between before I wrote Guilty, before I wrote Guilty Pleasures to prove that I didn't really know how to write a novel yet. Um, so that's how to do the marketing and how to believe in yourself and everything. But you writers write, put your butt in a chair, and try to do either the same time every day or do an hour a day, two hours a day, protect your writing time. And if, when I worked in corporate America, I couldn't write at the end of the day, I was exhausted. So I would get up an hour early that I even had to get ready for work and I would write for that hour. I would do two pages, two pages for that hour. And sometimes most of the pages were, it's so early I can't think and I would just type that. Mm -hmm. And, but eventually, those pages added up and the rough draft of it was written almost, almost all that way. Uh, I was in corporate America and I would get up early to write my stuff and then go to work. I love that your advice for pro approaching potential research uh, partners and agents is kind of essentially the same, which is kind of do that work, do your research first so that we people know that you're, that you're serious about it. Um, I have two similar questions from Melissa and Olympia. Um, so uh, Olympia says um, you helped uh, her a lot in her teens to come to terms with her sexuality in a country like Turkey. So her question was, did you know all of the aspects of Anita's world or did it grow with time? And then Melissa kind of similarly asks, uh, was the, the moral journey of the series a surprise as her creator? Well, I am very happy that Anita, that my books could help you find your own, your own way. Um, and uh, yes, the moral journey was a surprise to me. Um, when I started off, Anita and I both, I, Anita and I were the same age when the book started, and we both had a very black and white view of the world. Good, evil, very simple. Um, Card-carrying Episcopalians, uh, married to my college sweetheart, very traditional. And then gradually along the way, both Anita and I changed in different ways. I mean, uh, some of it is a shared journey, but I married early, I have a child, she doesn't. I have very cute toy dogs and cats and she doesn't have pets. I mean, she doesn't really have time for them. Um, so the moral journey and the changes were complete surprises to me, they weren't planned at all. Um, I would have, my writing group could tell you loud and long that I said that Jean-Claude would never date Anita that would never, I would never contribute to the idea that vampires were romantic. I remember saying that quite a lot. Um, and that Richard, I created the character of Richard to marry Anita so that we wouldn't have to kill Jean-Claude, but he still wouldn't take over the series and put it in a direction I didn't want to go. And you see how well all that worked out. <laughs> so, so no, it was a surprise to me. I didn't know that's where we were going. And Interestingly enough, though, I did not know that the term poly or polyamorous existed until actually I was already writing it on paper and, and living it. I didn't know it was a word, though. And it, wasn't, it was actually at a book signing that stood up and says, thank you for making a positive example of poly. And I said, well, you're welcome. I don't know what that means. I don't know what the <laughs> word means. And they had to explain it to me. Um, Matthew asked if you considered doing any backstory stories for any of the older vampires. I've considered it, but Anita's my camera on the world, so I don't know how to do it. 
it's a first person narrative kind of thing. And you could do it as a story told to her. But I just, I, I think that's really hard to pull off and keep an immediacy to it. Uh, Jess asks if there are any other Mary books on the horizon. There are, there is going to be another Mary book. Um, there may, but I don't know when. I know that the next book will be, uh, will be Anita. It, it's supposed to be one of the small books like Micah or Jason, and I say supposed to be because the page count's getting a little away from me. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's gonna be a smaller book, but not as small as I had planned. Um, but then the one after that I know is, because I've got it mostly done as well, is going to be a new character in a new world, brand new. So it would have to be, and I think after that is one more big Anita book and probably then Mary. So, but strangely enough, uh, I, I don't know, I don't know. Everybody else uh, seems to be, I don't know what to do to help everybody. I, I don't know what to do to, to make this less awful for us all. So I'm a writer, so I write. And so I have, I finished Sucker Punch just before we went into lockdown. Uh, my editor and managing editor, we edited it while they were locked down in New York. And once that was done, then I was going, oh, well, and I had already started on the New World book, had to stop that to do the edits on Cypher Punch. And then I came up with this idea that I didn't want you to go another year without Anita, because so many of you tell me how important she is to you. So I came up with the idea that I would do a small book. And I, I, I was gonna to try to make it a secret, but I'm terrible at keeping them. I have to either say nothing or I give something away. And, and this is true. So I didn't mean to, but I said already what the book is about, so I can't be cagey about it. So it's Raphael. It's all about Raphael and the were rats. It is finally we get to explore them. They've been the one shapeshifter group from the very first book. And we've never had them on stage in a major way. Both Raphael and Claudia are on stage in a major way. And that will be out in February of 2021. So you guys are not going to have to wait very long. And the plan is that the new book will then be out, will be the summer book for, for me. And um, so that was all I could think to do, was write faster to give you more stories quicker. Um, I, I've even got some short story ideas, uh, like some short stories that I did in uh, uh, North Atoll, uh, and, which is an Anita original, and uh, in Fantastic Hope. Uh, so I may use the short stories to give you guys more stories in between if, but I first have to finish Raphael, nothing until that is finished so that you guys will absolutely positively get it on time. It's crazy to me that you are still editing Sucker Punch and still finishing it when all of this started because we were already in talks to set up a book signing for a book that you hadn't finished yet. That's, that's crazy. That's fast for publishing too. Like publishing okay. never works that fast. <laughs> It does for me. Yeah. It does for me. But for a while there, I was bringing two books out a year mm -hmm. I, from different publishers. Mm -hmm. uh, Random Penguin, uh, Penguin in uh, Penguin Random House was Penguin Putnam in Random House. Mm -hmm. And I had Mary with Random House and I had Anita with Penguin Putnam. And um, so back when I was at separate things, I would routinely do two great big books a year and I would see, I would, I didn't realize how much we were doing it and how quickly we were turning it around until um, one bookstore, I think it was in LA, uh, said to me, this is great. We just had you here three months ago. <laughs> and I went, what? And we looked at the dates and by golly, they had had us there for the other series only three months ago. And I was doing three to six week tours and that was crazy. I did that for like 10 years. That was insane. I don't know how I did it. I, I, I don't even know what I was thinking, except that I had two publishers and they both wanted to do it. And I thought, this is great. You know, most writers never get to sit out on big tours. And so of course I would do it. But now I look back and I go, I have no idea how I did that. So I've always had a quicker turnaround because I, I'm, I'm quick, I write quickly is a general rule. Uh, took a little bit of a hiatus and started to do every two years, but I tried to relax and do other things. It's just not my gig. Not really.
Uh, uh, there is not a name attached to it, but someone has asked, who is your most inspirational character? Um, I don't know how to answer that because I'm not, I mean, I am not as inspired by my characters as the people who read them because I have to create them. And so they come out of my head. Um, I am very proud of Nathaniel for turning his life around and growing as a person. Um, but most of my big characters that do big surprises surprise me too. Uh, Edward's growth was not planned. I, I had no idea that he would end up, you know, the, the family man. That's just insane when I created him. Um, I am very proud of the growth and, and the healing that some of my characters have done. And, uh, but I'm not, I'm not inspired by them the way that I think the question means, or maybe I don't understand the question. Um, so sort of another character question then, which character do you love writing the most? Well, ease of writing is Anita. Her voice is close to mine, so she's the easiest to write. And every writer loves the one who lets them write the easiest. I'm sorry, that's just true. Um, I love writing Jason. He's got great dialogue and he's always fun. Edward's fun, but Edward doesn't talk to me directly. So he surprises me all the time and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. Um, I, you know, so I like writing Edward, but I never know what he's gonna do. And, um, I'm starting to, I mean, I like writing Nikki. Nikki is interesting. Again, I don't always know what Nikki's gonna do, but he's, but he's interesting. Um, I like writing Olaf, but he's also disturbing. I find him very disturbing. Um, I really thought that, he's one of those characters I didn't think would last this long. I thought he'd be dead by now. <laughs> I was like, I just I didn't think he'd be able to behave himself long enough to not be, have to be killed. Um, I've seen several people ask this question and I was actually about to ask it before I saw it pop up too. So how do you keep track of all of the details with all of the characters and the places? Do you have like a series Bible that you refer to or do you have like beta readers that just kind of know all of this stuff for you? Uh, no and no. Uh, everyone says, do you have a, you must have a, a huge character by I said, no, I don't. I keep thinking I need one, but at this point it's a little late. Yeah. Uh, I know what my characters look like. I mean, I... I've written them for a number of years. It's, they're like my friends. You don't forget what your friends look like. Characters that haven't been on stage as much sometimes though. What I will do is I, I use my own books as almost a character Bible. I will go back to the last time they were on stage. I'll read that book. If I have to, I'll go back and read every time they were on stage until I go, oh yes, there, there we have it. Um, so no, I don't have a character Bible. It'd probably be handy. The, the, and it probably keep me from having characters that are very tall anyway, and then they'll grow for one to two inches. I mean, I mean, and it's always the really tall or the not so tall that either shrink or grow. People in the middle, like your five eights, five nines, they stay solid. I never, I don't know why, but that's what happens. Um, and for some reason, if I'm gonna change character eye color of a minor major character, it's gonna be from blue to brown or brown to blue almost never any other colors switch, switched. So what I really want though is a Mary character Bible because uh, my wonderfully clever idea of making them triple irises, it's beautiful to think about. It's heck to keep track of eye color. It's so hard. So uh, what I really need is, is a Mary Bible just for eye color. <laughs> um, but, uh, and tattoos, <coughs> and tattoos. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, and, uh, you asked a character Bible, what was the other question? I uh, just, how do you, how do you keep track with kind of everything? So I think you got, you got that. Um, so several people have asked about this too. Jade wants to know what is something that they as fans can do to help get you a Netflix series or any kind of screen adaptation? I have no idea. I'll be honest. I mean, I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't want to start anything <laughs> and get everybody like all been out of shape. Um, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Would it work if everybody wrote into to, to Netflix? I don't know. And I don't want to get everybody started if I don't know it will be a positive. So um, I, I don't know. 
I don't know. I, I once upon a time signed for a series and we got to the point where we were looking at actresses for, to be Anita. Um, but, uh, then it just, more contracts are written in Hollywood than ever will be made into movies or TV shows. It's, it, it's a frightening number. I actually know writers who make a very good living optioning their books. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then never get it made and they don't want it made. They, they, they actually just want the money and then it comes back to them and they're good with that. And they actually, I know some writers that make more money optioning books that never get made into movies than they do from their actual writing. Mm -hmm. And um, so I don't know. Um, I don't know. But I have to say that, that when we first started trying to get Anita made, it was after, you know, there was more, there was more violence. Violence is fine in America. It's the sex that bothers everybody. So at the time when we started, there hadn't been as much ground broken for sexual content and erotic content. Um, so now, and special effects hadn't caught up to like Mary. So now the special effects have caught up pretty much to anything we'd want to do. And uh, the erotic content is, we've, we've all seen it already to, on other series. So I used to be too avant-garde and too, too risque. And now suddenly, you know, everyone's caught up with me. Or something like that. So at least that wouldn't be a stumbling block anymore. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I, I think kind of just as as readers, you, the people don't realize just how much like something could be bought by some director, and then that director moves like, or they they have other projects, or something falls through. There are just how many variables that are involved, and actually in hurdles to get something to the screen. And sometimes if you get a major star attached to it, if they then have a different project, their mm -hmm. name leaves, and then the project's dead. Yeah. So you can have a big time director leave, same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, things can go through hand after hand after hand after hand before they get made. It's, it's, it's really, the more you know of how it works, the more I am amazed anything gets done. Yeah. Uh, so Eleni asks, do you have um, kind of an end game for Anita or does it change from book to book? I've never had an end game for Anita. Anita to me is a mystery series. And anybody who reads uh, Mystery Series knows that they are open-ended, most of them. Uh, you know, John D. McDonald's, the Travis McGee series. Uh, I can't remember how many books it went into at that point. And then same for the Spencer, Spencer books. Uh, that's kind of been my example for, for Anita, is that it's open-ended. Uh, there may come, I, I don't know if they'll ever come, right now, I still love the world and the characters, and I learn something new every time I write them. So, and when I write anything else, even Mary, I miss them. Um, I miss Mary and her world. I honestly do, guys. But after the last book, and no spoilers on that, I'm still getting people that haven't read it or just found Mary as well as finding Anita. So please don't spoil the last book. But um, uh, the last book was very hard for Mary and very hard for me. It was very emotionally, emotionally wrought. And um, so it's taken me a while to figure out what how to go back at it. And Mary is basically, as a character said, leave me alone until you figure out how to do a better happy ever after the ending this, than this. Don't come, don't come back to me. With Anita, I always thought Mary was easier to deal with than Anita, and that has changed. Mary is now basically, you I come to my own character with ideas, I go, how about this? And she goes, not good enough. Go away, come back later. Try again. Uh, so Winter asks, um, how, what is a normal writing day for you? Do you have a certain number of hours that you want to work? Do you have a, a certain word count that you want to hit every day? I do page count and I do time. Um, I try to get in at my desk by eight or earlier. If I get in by nine, for some reason, it just, it sets me off. And the reason is I wish I didn't work this way, but I do. I need at least a four hour segment. Four hours is my minimum. If I only have an hour or two, the only way I can use that effectively is if the book is really hot near the end, when I'm writing fa as fast as I can type. Um, but any other time, I need four hours because two of those four hours is not productive. I do not, I do not write. I, I, I've actually experimented with this, watching myself, keeping track of things. I write usually in the last two to to one hour, and I will do almost all my pages then. But 
I still need that two hours of lead up time where I putter and do nothing because if I try to shortchange the situation and do the two hours and think, oh, I can do it that way. No, I can't. Two hours and I go, oh, now I know how to do this. I, I, I call it, for me, I fight my way in. I fight my way in for about two hours and then somewhere after that time, I start to write. And I really wish I didn't work like this because that means that <laughs> I need hours, hours of uninterrupted time. And I know other writers who four hours and they're done, two hours and they're done. Most people can't even write, sit at their desk for more than two hours, they're done. Um, I am the exception to a great many rules. So I will go in in the morning, I will write until lunch, then, um, if I have time, I will go back and write in the afternoon if I don't have gym or martial arts. Um, and if it's really, if I don't have time in the afternoon to go back and do a four hour session and the book is either really due or really hot, um, then I'll go back in the evening after dinner for a few hours. And as my husband would tell you, those few hours in the evening often end more than a few hours and suddenly it's like 2 a.m. and I'm still writing. Um. Kitty asks, are we going to get to meet Anita's family, specifically her step monster? <laughs> we are going to get to meet uh, Anita's family, uh, her father, on her father's side. We're going to meet her father and stepmother, and, um, and I don't know if the sister or the brother are going to be coming uh, to this particular book, but uh, we are going to have Grandma Blake, though. I know she's insisting on coming, um, because, uh, and we have to do that before the wedding. Because everyone, it's, it's been interesting uh, talking online, especially Twitter, because um, I, I asked people, you know, what characters haven't you seen online that, that I started it there and said, what would you like to see? And it's interesting that most of the things that people want to see, I'm already got my list on. But um, people had very different views on how Anita meeting her father, stepmom, and that side of the family would go. Some people understood step monster. Um, but some people really thought there'd be a reconciliation. That's kind of where they're going. And some people thought that, you know, there'd be this, that she, that, that Jean-Claude would, Jean-Claude would ask his permission to marry her. I'm sorry. She's in her early thirties. She's lived on her own for a decade. I don't understand asking permission from anyone. And, and here's the thing that still gets me. If, I, if Anita was a man, nobody would say that his spouse-to-be has to ask the mother's permission. No one ever turns that around. This is one of those few lingering things that is so sexist to me. I, I, it, sorry, bugaboo. No one that I have ever married has asked anyone's permission. Uh, so Jackson asks, he says, uh, you have been such an, uh, an advocate for the LGBTQ plus community. Any chance that we might see a trans character in any of the books? I have been talking to people and let me just say that the definition of what trans means is not uniform in the community. It is not. And until I can get a definition that enough people agree on, I'm not going to tread there because other people will think I've got it wrong. And if I do it, I want to make as many people happy with the presentation as possible. And I've even had people that already think that Narcissus and Chains, that Narcissus counts as trans, but he's intersexed. He's intersexed. He's, he's not technically trans, but I have other people that will disagree with me on that. So the majority though, we all agree, intersexed is the phrase for, for Narcissus. He was born literally intersexed. And, um, but, but then I have other people that have happily said I already have a trans character in him. So until the definition can be more solidified so that we can all agree on it, I'm, I, I don't want to go off and think I know what I'm doing and then have so many people that it touches so intimately feel that they have been misrepresented. Um, uh, uh, Raphael asks, uh, I'm sorry, Rachel asks, was Raphael the first wear animal she met? Uh, not on stage. On stage, not in, not, not, not in her life, no. She'd met other wear animals before that, but this was uh, the first wear rat she ever met, and it was the first one we meet on stage in the series, yes. 
Um, Nikki asks. Oh, oh, wait, 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 let me add. But, Technically, there was a a evil wear rat that we all that was an asshole that we met before Raphael came and took care of that situation. So yeah. Uh, so Nikki asks, does having dyslexia slow down the writing process um, at all? I'm sure it does, but I've never been anything but dyslexic, so I don't know. Um, no, go ahead. Um, I'll, the biggest thing is I wasn't diagnosed until my 40s, so I didn't know I was dyslexic. And now that I do know, I also know that um, if it's a bad day, I know that some names are going to change. There are some spellings in the Mary series that are misspellings. They are not in the Celtic baby name books because on a good day, I'll go back and look, relook it up because the, somebody flagged it in New York for spelling. And I'll realize I've transposed some of the vowels in, in the middle of the word because of dyslexia. So the spelling actually isn't there. So some things are accidentally made up because of the dyslexia. Uh, Olympia asks, do you have any advice for somebody who has lots of ideas but doesn't know how to make them calm down to write them? Um, or basically kind of a way to translate those ideas into something that like other people will be able to understand? Uh, like having too many ideas, not being able to choose. Yeah. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the thing you're going to hate, and that is you have to choose one. And, but but what you can do, if you're, if you're one of those people, and I do this sometimes too, is you're typing along on one idea and then another idea pops into your head. I have sticky notes or a writer's notebook that's right beside me mm -hmm. at all times. And I write it on the sticky note. I stick it on the top of the desk or the top of the drawer. And I know I've not lost the idea. And then I go back to working on what I've got in front of me. Because you can not sell something that is not finished. You cannot edit something that's not finished. You have to write to completion to be able to, to edit. Now, you can write to the end and go, I don't know how the climactic fight scene ends. And you can write, I don't know how the climactic fight scene ends. Then you can go back to the beginning and you can edit as you go, because as you edit through the second draft, you'll figure, you'll have know more by the time you get to your climactic fight scene. Mm -hmm. um, but having too many ideas, you have to choose. And it's okay to write the beginnings of like a short story and find out that maybe the idea is not strong enough. But I don't know how to tell you the difference between stories that aren't strong enough and just writing a few pages and stopping. It's very hard to tell the difference. Uh, so Jackson asks, do you have a Princess Bride quote in every book? Maybe. <laughs> it's one of the most quotable movies ever, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it is also one of those movies, that even though you own it, if you're clicking through the channels and you see it, oh, I'll just watch this scene. Mm -hmm. And there you are at the end and you watch <laughs> the whole movie. Uh, so uh, probably, uh, probably Princess Bride and Nietzsche are the two things I most often quote. <laughs> um. Carrie asks, how did you come up with Z Zabrowski as a character? Zabrowski came that way. I can't even take credit. It's like, like he just popped out of my brain. I have no idea. I love Zabrowski. He is so fun. Um, I do have a short story idea with him and his family. Um, but, uh, you know, he's, he's just that, that wonderful continuing ensemble bit character that just adds to everything he's in. Um, we've had a couple people ask, and somebody under this said watch spoilers, so if there is spoilers involved in this, feel free to not answer it. Um, Marion asks, um, and a couple of people, will we ever see the fourth mark come true? Um, I don't know, and actually there's some debate. Uh, somebody, may, somebody pointed out that, is that, has that boat sailed? Has she already done the fourth mark with Damien and Nathaniel? And can she then do it with another vampire or not? And you know what? We don't know. And I keep writing scenes and cutting the scene. Mm -hmm. So I will just say that, that she and Jean-Claude have discussed this. And Jean-Claude is waiting to see if Damien starts to age. Because she's the master. And if she's not immortal and they don't get Damien's immortality, 
basically, if Damien comes up with a gray hair, Jean-Claude's not doing it. Um, somebody also just mentioned, going back to the thing about asking um, a father's permission to marry a daughter, um, she said it's by, yeah, I definitely agree that it's uh, by far antiquated and sexist. But uh, part, this is Jenna. She says part of her could see uh, Jean-Claude asking her dad just due to the fact that the time that he came from making it necessarily and normal. Do you think that maybe has something to do with it? Her father will not say yes. Yeah. Her father is a devout Catholic at the Catholic Church in the news world. At best, at best, vampires are suicides, which yeah. means that they are damned. Now, the reason the suicide is damned, though, is because they can't ask forgiveness of the church. So technically, you could get around that, maybe, but really they see them as uh, demons. They, they see vampires as lost souls or demons. So if the church sees them that way and they're devout Catholics, then Anita's soul is in terrible danger that she's about to marry a vampire. It's uh, going to go well. And I saw Michelle has asked um, when this, when everything clears up, would you consider doing more virtual events like this um, for your international fans? And that's a great question, Michelle. And I will definitely also pass along to Aaron just how many of you guys have placed international orders. I think it's. I, I, I've actually offered. Um, I've actually offered to do something for uh, the UK, mm -hmm. the the my for my UK publisher. Um, because, uh, you know, with every, all of us are still all across the world, we're still in lockdown and stuff. And so, you know, I would be willing to do something for the, for the out of, you know, out of the United States, the foreign uh, fans, uh, if we could get the time zones all worked out because yeah, I know that changes rapidly. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but no, I, I would be, I would be open to doing some with foreign fans. So if, if English is not the language that is majorly spoken, then I would need more help. Yeah. Um, so for, with your UK publication schedule, are you roughly kind of similar to your publishing time frame here in the US or are they different? UK is similar. It is almost identical to the yeah. United States. Um, everybody else is not, mm -hmm. not it, but, but United, United Kingdom is. You, you, uh, Nicole asks, given Anita's upbringing and religious beliefs, how did she realize she was polyamorous and how did she adapt her life to being such? Um, I don't think she thought she was polyamorous. I think she just realized that she wasn't monogamous, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think Anita, went, because I went into it without really realizing that that was... Anita didn't go into it as clear cut as I did, but uh, you know, it's this idea that you realize that monogamy isn't working for you and that you may be in love with more, for Anita, it was being in love with more than one person and to be genuinely in love with more, per, more than one person. And society tells you that's wrong, that there's only that one great love. And when your heart is telling you that maybe that's not true and so much else that they tell you is not true, um, it made her, willing to look outside the box. And Jean-Claude being uh, already in love with Asher, off and on. I mean, you know, Asher is, 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 is the little complicated, pretty mess he is. Um, I think the fact that, and that she could feel that Jean-Claude was in love with other people already, I think that that probably helped her open up to it. Um. And I just saw, uh, so Winter also said, you know, even for people in the U.S. who can't travel to see you, she loved this event. Thank you, Winter. Um, one of the, just as a bookseller, uh, one of the things that we have loved about doing this is being able to get the technology up and running and figuring out how to do all of this. And I know a lot of other bookstores like us are really looking forward to figuring out kind of how we could potentially still do more stuff like this to be able to supplement our um, actual in-store events as well. Um, you could do more of these quickly rather yeah. than traveling the country. That's always longer. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're really excited to see kind of once the world kind of reverts to whatever the world's going to look like when all of this is done, kind of how we'll be able to still be able to do some stuff like this for people who, like you said, hate to travel, have travel issues and just like even people that live in the UK that we're not able to do events with. So it's going to be an interesting world to see what the book world's going to look like um, when we are done with this. So Rachel asks, uh, do you love writing vampires or shifters more? 
Um, I don't have a preference on writing because I didn't sit down to write a vampire book. I didn't sit down to write a about werewolves. I sat down to write characters that happen to be vampires and characters that happen to be werewolves or werelepards. Um, I think uh, people have asked me over the years how my characters are so uh, so human, so well rounded, and for vampires. And I'm going well. It's because I don't think of them as vampires. I think Jean Claude is Jean Claude to me. He is a vampire. But that is not his primary focus as a person to me. Jean-Claude is still him regardless of that. Um, you know, uh, Richard in all his tortured soul uh, is Richard, not a werewolf first. And that goes across the board for, you know, Micah and Nathaniel. They mm -hmm. are people to me before they are their werelepards. And so, um, so I don't have a preference on that. I, I enjoy writing both. Um, I like exploring the, continuing to explore the magic system in Anita's world and, uh, and having it grow and build on itself. So I like it all. Uh, I, I, I like it all and I like intermingling it. I think that's obvious at this point. I think one of the things that I love personally, kind of as a reader myself about um, urban fantasy, and you, you just said this, is that it's a really great way to be able to tell these kind of very human stories in a non-human way. And I think that's kind of one of the best things about the genre is you can kind of tackle issues that, um, because of the paranormal element to it, people are kind of be able to kind of explore and kind of deal with things kind of in a way that's kind of a safe space because the, the paranormal gives it a little bit of a disconnect. Uh, I've actually been told by uh, one of the uh, the time premier editors in, in regular mystery, straight mystery, um, mm -hmm. I was told when the series, when Anita just first started really hitting big, that uh, she loved the series and she said, and I'm so glad that you had the horror elements, she says, because uh, it would never have sold as mystery because the level of violence and sexuality and the fact that she was a woman in a first person narration and I was a female writer, that that they still would not, if I was male, they'd allow it, but wow. not if I was female. And that double standard is still true in mystery, yeah. uh, as far as I know. And um, so horror, it is, it is horror that allowed me to, the fact that it was horror elements. Uh, fantasy wouldn't have allowed it. But horror is like all holds off. And so because of that being, it, having that, everybody, it's okay. If there are monsters, it's okay. You can talk about all sorts of things. And um, the fact that my series was popular and sold, that opened the book, uh, that opened the way for other people to come and play. And then as you break the barriers, now suddenly there's supernatural, there's, there's cozy mysteries that are supernaturals. Yeah. There's a whole subgenre. I didn't even know that until recently, that there's a whole genre of, of, of cozy mysteries that have ghosts and witches and things. Yeah. And uh, so Supernatural's everywhere now. Have you read uh, Victoria Laurie's Ghost Hunter cozy ones? They're real, so she has two series. She's got one character who's a professional psychic, that's the Abby Coopers, but she's got this other series, it's Victoria Laurie, the Ghost Hunter Mysteries. They're really great because they're cozies, but she's got these really scary ghosts and they're also balanced with really fun um, horror, or uh, really fun humor elements to it too. So it's a really great mix that almost kind of pushes the line of like kind of how scary you can be in cozies. Those are some of my favorites. Cozies are interesting because no matter how many people die, it's still supposed to be fun. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it takes a real, it's really a hard line to, to, mm -hmm. to you know, where's that line? Where did it stop being fun when the body fell out of yeah. the clock at this time? Yeah. Uh, so it, it's, it's its own, um, its own difficulty level, I think. So for those of you who are watching who might not be aware of what a cozy mystery is, think kind of Murder, She Wrote or a Hallmark Channel movie where there happens to be a body in it. They're generally amateur sleuths who kind of stumble across a body. There's no on-scene violence. There's no on-scene gore. There's no graphic language. You know, if anybody had, you know, has any kind of sexual relations, it's usually all behind the closed door. But like she said, I mean, there's still, you know, I just finished one that had like two or three bodies in it but it's still considered a cozy mystery because you don't actually see them like get killed on screen um so and also the lightness it still stays light somehow uh -huh. it never gets into that grittiness that the the, 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 the hard-boiled gets into or that some of the, the it never gets into that scariness 
as the thriller mysteries do. Yeah. It's it really is a very fine line to walk, and I don't know how you do it because if a body falls out in my books, it's going to be scary and it's going to be gory. It's going to be exactly what it is. I I read cozy mysteries because they just manage to make mysteries kind of fun and charming. Mm -hmm. They're my go-to if I like can't figure out what I want to read next, and like they're like kind of a really just great reset book for me. Um, let's see, Hannah asks, which character frustrates you the most to write? Uh, that's 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 going to be a hard toss-up. Richard's frustrating for a lot of reasons um, because he doesn't know what he wants, and I'm still waiting for him to tell me. Uh, Asher's frustrating because, but Asher has started therapy and actually they've managed to find uh, some some good therapeutic drugs that are working work for vampires so he's he's helping forge for other vampires that maybe you know they can get healthier uh, I hate seeing people be self-destructive when they have happiness offered to them that's one of my big frustrations so that frustrates me uh, I'm I am frustrated when I have characters that could be happy and choose not to be, or seem to choose not to be to me. That frustrates me. Um, will, will we ever see Anita travel to the Pacific Northwest? I don't know. Uh, I have, certainly I have, I have lists of mysteries, a uh, list of potential uh, supernaturals, and some of them could be in that section of the world. Uh, but we did go to Washington State. We did go to Washington State in Hit List. But we spent so much of our time indoors or looking at dismembered bodies that really was hard to admire the scenery. Um, Nina asks, do you have any idea when the audio version of Sucker Punch is going to be available? I do not. Um, I do not, though someone told me it was out, but I may be wrong on that, so I don't know. I thought it was out. I don't know. Okay, fair. Um, let's see. Michelle asks, what do you think of non-predatory animals as shifters? Could there any, ever be anything like that in Anita's world? And as they've been talking, she's thinking of things like, you know, swans or, or, or you know, smaller animals like rabbits and things as shifters. We already have swans. We already have uh, we already have um, swan mains and their swan king. So Audible has it. Somebody says it's amazing. So yes, thanks to scrolling across my screen, so Audible already has it out. Um, and thank you that it was amazing. Uh, we already have swans, um, and there are Scottish witches that used to turn into supposedly into rabbits and things like that. But for me, it's a matter of mass. I know, I know, we're already shifting into an animal, so why do I care about physics? But I do. And the most mass loss per to change into an animal is probably the wear swans or the swan manes, but it is a birth, it's not a, it's not a disease. It is, they, 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 they are around puberty, it hits. They know they're already going to turn into swans and it's a natural ability. Uh, but if it's a really small animal, where does all that mass go? I just, I can't do the physics for it. So, um, and people have asked, you know, uh, about this before, but I also am trying to stick to real folklore, real mythology as much as I can. So most of them are predatory. You do have people who turn into rabbits and cats and um, crows, of course, uh, and other things, but for the most part, um, Mm, no, we're not going to do non-predatory uh, because I just can't figure out rabbits are small. <laughs> so Hannah asks on the opposite end of that then, uh, she wants to know if Anita's going to travel to other countries and get to meet more native shifters and creatures like dragons in China, for example. So from little baby rabbits to dragons. There are no dragons left in China. Communists wouldn't have liked that. That would definitely be on the list of no-nos. I'm sorry if 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 all if religion is considered a superstition under the communist, then I I, I think dragons are definitely going to go under that. No, yeah. uh, and even if they did exist, they'd probably be used and chopped up for Chinese medicine. That that sounds unpleasant. 
Um, and now that you've said that, I, now that I hear myself say that, oh, it really is unpleasant, that may show up because that was really an unpleasant thought that I just had. <laughs> if, it, if it bothers me enough, it will usually end up in the books. If it disturbs me enough, it'll usually end up there. Um, we'll be seeing uh, some people from other countries that have backgrounds that are unusual like that come to Anita, but uh, for traveling, um, now, now that certain things are safer for her to travel, we, we will, we do have some ideas for traveling out of country. I'd love to go back to Ireland. I did so much research that I didn't get to use. So much research I didn't get to use. So kind of talking about, um, you know, you're using uh, different mythologies and stuff that to base stuff on. Are you um, hesitant at all if you're doing things like potentially Chinese mythology or other mythologies like that to make sure that, you, that you're getting it accurate? Is that a concern when you're writing? Chinese, not as much, because I would be going back to older stories that are not as pertinent to any current uh, religious, uh, religious or current things. Um, that wouldn't be as big a problem. Um, other countries, uh, other places would be. Um, I am very, like, I have been collecting from India, things for, from India for the line, and that would be definitely delving into things that are still believed. So I want to make sure and get that right. Uh, and so any place that is an active front of the head belief mm -hmm. or very common superstition, even that's daily life, I am trying to be very careful and it does make me hesitant. Um, one of the hardest things to do for me is I do more Native American, except that every time I find a great book on Native American, then I go back through and look at it and, and start talking to people that are Native American and find out that most of the best sources were people that were brought in in like the 40s and 50s and they were made to feel at home and a part of, a part of the culture and they were told things in private and in secret and then they published them. And so uh, it's good information, it's accurate information, but there are some people that are from that racial mm -hmm. culture that say that it was something sacred to them and they, it wasn't supposed to be published. And then if I use that, then am I also uh, guilty of that? It, it makes it very hard to know how to use things, even if they're on the shelf uh, and, and the book is accurate. Like, is it, is, is, was this allowed? Was this, was this approved? Did everybody go, yes, you can publish that. If not, what do I do? So I would do more Native American if I could find books that were not um, tainted with that. Um, so if you guys are watching, we've got just a couple more minutes. So if you have any last questions, pop them up in there. I wanted to mention if you came in late, don't worry if you missed the beginning of it. Um, we will be getting it up, the chat up on YouTube after Laurel's done a couple of her other events, just so that way she's doing private events, people can still be able to enjoy those before we put it out there. So you'll be able to go back and catch up with um, any of the stuff that you might have missed, or if you just want to watch the whole thing again, it will definitely be up on our YouTube, and you can find that link on the Murder by the Book website. Um, we have, let's see, there's a couple more popping up. Uh, Marion wants to know if we're ever going to get more details on the military psycho training, or I'm sorry, the military psycho that trained Edward. Um, probably, but I don't know. I don't know. I, I know we'll get more hints. But uh, people ask if, if Van Cleef is ever going to be on stage, and I just, I don't know. Um, and then, oh, y'all are going fast. Um, uh, uh, Baroness Von T wants to know, do you have an actress in mind to play Anita? No. Um, uh, so Olympia says, if Damon starts to get old, isn't Jean-Claude the only salvation to all of them to live longer? But I, but if the third mark is already gone, if the fourth mark is already gone that way, I don't know if he can undo it. Um, we're kind of out, even, even in my world, we're out in the land of metaphysics that hasn't been done before. Um, I saw another question for Mary Books. Uh, as Anita said, or Laurel said, she is uh, hopefully soon ish. Um, let's see. Um, have, uh, oh, a couple of people have asked, will we ever figure out what Zabrowski's first name is? Apparently not. <laughs> Do 
Do you know what it is? No. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, great. So uh, thank you everybody for tuning in with us tonight. This has been an absolute blast. Laurel, thank you so much for doing this. This is, we've had so much fun chatting with you. Um, again, I'm so sorry we weren't able to do this in the store, but hopefully, you know, next time. Next time, next time in person. Yeah. Um, as I was mentioning before, we have a lot of great stuff coming up. Um, if you guys are all urban fantasy fans, I wanted to mention real quick, we've got an urban fantasy debut called White Trash Warlock by David Slayton that comes out in October. I just finished it. It's a really great uh, urban fantasy with a game main character. Um, that's coming out October 13th, and we're going to be doing an event with David for that. So definitely check out the Murder by the Book website for that. Um, if you were mystery fans, we've got so many upcoming author event stuff coming up. Um, Again, Laurel, thank you so much. I also wanted to give a big shout out to Aaron who has helped us um, behind the scenes with the Zoom tonight, also helping get everything set up. Um, I emailed her, we had started talking about setting this up, I don't know, like February or March, and we're like, oh, I'm sure we can get something on the books for August. It's, I'm sure all of this COVID stuff will blow over. And you know, right, <laughs> right? I, I, I really thought, when I, I dedicated this book to, to you guys before lockdown got even worse and weirder and all the other bad stuff started happening i really thought we'd be in person by now i thought we would be doing this in person i did when i reached out to her to figure out how we were going to do virtual the first email i replied was man i we were so dumb thinking that we were going to be done with all of this what's the next step going to be no um, but thank you so much this has been a great event thank you for for hosting and uh uh it's it's been fun well, thank you so much. Take care. Give, give our love to everybody with the family, and hopefully we will get to do this soon. Take care. Yes.